This is Professor Spihar from the University of Alaska Southeast. We discussed our so-called pre-analytic vision in previous discussions and learned that this vision requires us to broaden the scope of economics in order to embed the limiting impact that the global ecosystem has on our new ecological economic model. If this scope is to be broadened, then we must readdress the ultimate goals and purpose of the economics discipline. And this is the main discussion in this chapter. Typically, economics confines itself to the analysis of how society distributes factors of production, land, labor, and capital among producers, and how scarce resources are allocated among consumers. And we assume insatiable wants and, of course, rational behavior. And our goal in traditional economics is the goal of maximizing the welfare for society as a whole. Now, the favorite approach by traditional economists to address their problems with the allocation of scarce natural resources and social goods, both of which are not easily priced on the market, are to use the microeconomic tools that typically requires privatization of these resources. Now, examples include carbon credits for pollution abatement and private ownership of water to address water shortages. Privatization, though often a good solution in terms of efficiency, has its own problems, including encouraging continued economic growth and a loss of social control over our natural resources as they are put into the hands of private profit-oriented individuals. Many of these approaches fail to solve the problems as these solutions, which are embedded into the existing model, only encourages and promotes continued exponential economic growth. Now, the other big problem with the neoclassical approach is that the ultimate goals of increasing social welfare, which sounds good enough, is based on a welfare concept that is a little questionable, mainly because it sidesteps the issue of how social welfare is distributed across society. That is, by relying on the Pareto welfare definition of social welfare, which requires that any increase in welfare occur without harming anyone else in the process, ignores the impact of income distribution. And if it is extreme, any increase in welfare may actually end out seriously harming society. Remember, issues of income distribution become relevant because it is assumed that in a market capitalistic society, what is produced is determined by the dollar votes on the market. But it's not really very democratic if a society is characterized by extreme unequal distributions of income. If a small percentage of the population owns a very large share of the income and there is no or little middle class, then clearly what is produced will only reflect the desires of the total top income percentage. And this is a problem that can also have large impacts on the long-term social welfare for society at large. The problem is that this opinion of fair and just distributions of income fall within the normative field of economics, and any normative statements is frowned upon within our science. There are other very important problems with the market model that was discussed in Chapter 2 and that will be discussed in much more detail and depth in later chapters. Here, our only point is that once we decide to include a broader scope for analysis, that of preserving the long-term sustenance of the global ecosystem, we must readdress the objectives, scope, and purpose of a broader new model. But can we do this without really violating the so-called economic science? The answer is likely no. But because the current neoclassical model of our science is not really working for us anyway as a society in general, perhaps this perspective of preserving the neoclassical model is a bit of a luxury we can really no longer afford. All of the solutions to the problems that we are currently facing in today's society all require additional economic growth to solve the issues. 
and economic growth is only exacerbating our problems. Yet, the more we try to solve them with our current model, the deeper and larger the problems seem to become. Is it time that we stop and state in no uncertain terms what we want our system to do? Now, in spite of the fact that this approach does have its own problems, after all, whose goals are we going to embrace? Your definition? My definition? The Republicans' definition? Or the Democrats'? It opens up a Pandora's box and requires us to step, or even jump if you will, into the mire. But we are going to do this. This is what this chapter is about. We are going to attempt to jump into the mire and state right up front that we do have as our goals the maintenance of ecological life support systems far from the edge of collapse and a healthy, satisfied human population free to work together in the pursuit and clarification of, and here is our problem, a still vague ultimate end. But let's do say all of this does require an end to material growth of the economy, because we are assuming a sustained level of economic growth. Let's begin this chapter by using the same definition of economics that traditional economists use. But instead, let's introduce two new terms, means and ends. Our means will replace the term for resources in many cases. And then in this chapter, we will try to come to a better understanding of what, quote unquote, our means really are from a much broader perspective. We will also broaden the traditional economics model of the ultimate goals of economics. Increasing social welfare might seem like a sufficient goal, but we know that this goal requires us to grow continually our GDP exponentially, which is only exacerbating our problems. So we want to be able to include also normative goals as well, so we are not avoiding important societal issues such as the long-term ecological limitations imposed by our small blue planet. Now again, remember, increasing social welfare according to traditional economics is the goal of economics, but it is not able to address the normative goals such as a quote-unquote better income distribution or increased preservation of the ecological ecosystem in the long run or even addressing sustainable economic growth. And to be clear, to suggest that a sustainable economic growth is the goal does suggest a direct attack on the current economic model. But if we do not have as our goal a sustainable growth, then we are directly attacking any hope of a long-term, sustainable, viable economy that preserves ecosystems quote-unquote, far from the edge of collapse, and thus long-term social welfare for society as a whole for both today and tomorrow's generations. So this chapter will address not just the means, but also what the new normative goals of economics should be. That is, the so-called ends of our new discipline. As such, all of this concludes with assuming that what our objectives will be in this course are first to define what our means are and how to define it, what our ends are and how to define it. Can we define a spectrum from the means to the ends? And how do these ends and means duality impact policy? Finally, we will show that there are three possible strategies for integrating ecology and economics and show which strategy equates with the traditional economic models and which model we will use in this course. We just defined ultimate means as a common denominator of usefulness that cannot be produced for which we are totally dependent on the natural environment. This common denominator for which we are totally dependent on the natural environment is called low entropy matter energy. Our fundamental existence that results from entropic flow that is sustained by sunlight is, in other words, entropic dissipation. According to the first law of thermodynamics, we do not use up matter and energy, 
but we do use up its quality of usefulness to serve our ends as we transform matter and energy for our purposes during production. This is due to the second law of thermodynamics. To use natural resources implies some kind of technological transformation as we use resources to serve our production ends. This assumes a flow from a concentrated source to a dispersed sink. And this implies entropic transformation from low entropy matter energy to high entropy matter energy. Daly and Farley, our textbook author, state, the capacity for entropic transformations of matter energy to be useful in the production process implies a reduction, both by the emptying of finite sources and by the filling up of finite sinks as wastes. If there are no entropic gradient between source and sink, the environment would be incapable of serving our purposes or even sustaining our lives, end quote. Technical knowledge helps us use low entropy more efficiently, but it cannot eliminate the direction of low entropy to high entropy flow in the transformation of raw natural resources, or in other words, from low entropy sources to the production output, which are high entropy sinks. Matter can be recycled, but it does so by using more energy and material implements to do so. Some amount of matter may be recycled, but certainly cannot be 100% recycled, as this requires additional energy. And energy can only be recycled by engaging more energy, carrying out the recycling, than the amount recycled. So it is never economic to recycle energy, regardless of the price. Recycling also implies additional material implements for collection, processing, concentration, transportation, etc. in order to recycle. The process to collect, concentrate, and transport will themselves wear out through a process called entropic dissipation. Can we really violate the second law of throughput via technical know-how? Is waste a resource that we have not yet learned how to use in our production process? Can we really face a world where scarcity will be eliminated and we will have infinite resource capacity to apply to our unending, insatiable wants? The common view among economists is that waste is just a resource we have not yet learned how to use that nature supplies only the indestructible building blocks of elemental atoms, and that all the rest either is or can be recreated by humans with only technical know-how and innovation. <laughs> Excuse me while I smile, but this is the ultimate in value added of human labor and capital. That to which value is added is just simply thought. But this denigration of the importance of the physical world, the exclusive emphasis on knowledge as our ultimate resource, seems to be, as Daly and Farley point out, nothing more than a modern version of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the conviction that matter is evil and that emancipation comes through Gnosis, the knowledge of spirit mysteries that the created material world or matter is evil and therefore in opposition to the world of spirit or knowledge and that only the spirit or knowledge is actually good. It appears to be religiously motivated by a complete denial of our creaturehood as part of the material world or by a belief that we have or soon will have transcended the world of material creation and entered into an unlimited realm of esoteric knowledge, albeit technical know-how rather than spiritual. But thus, even in the discussion of means, we are pushed out of the purely biophysical realm and man-made capital or technology is said to substitute for nature's natural services. Imagine the attempt to replace nature's services of pollination. Just simply facing the brute fact that we can only get so much energy from a lump of coal and that we cannot burn the same lump of coal twice and that many of our global economies rely heavily on coal should give us pause alone. But even if it were possible to eliminate and solve the second law of thermodynamics, 
Are we playing a game of Russian roulette? How close are we willing to play this game with the consequence of one mistake resulting in a catastrophic consequence of the Earth's ecosystem? Do we ignore the limits and just assume that our innovative capacity will solve every limit that nature imposes in time to address the limits as we face them? This is really a dangerous game and we must ask ourselves at some point if it is even fair to play this game when it is our progeny and future generations who will ultimately pay the price if we are dead wrong. We argued earlier that there is a such thing as ultimate means and that it is low entropy matter energy and that the market is a very useful and necessary but by no means sufficient institution for allocating means to the service of our societal ends. And later we defined our ultimate ends. Yet how do we go about determining a hierarchy of ends ordered with reference to some concept of the ultimate end? Well, before we do that, let's first understand the presuppositions of an ecological economist in regards to policy. Are there necessary presuppositions for policy to even make sense, to be even worth discussing for the ecological economist? Well, we see two such presuppositions. First, we assume we are non-determinists, that the world is not totally determined and that there is an element of freedom that offers us real alternatives that ultimately will have an impact on society. And secondly, we are non-nihilists and assume that there is a real criterion of value to guide our choices, however vaguely we may all perceive it. Since the ecological economist is committed to policy relevance, let's talk about what this non-determinism and non-nihilism really means. The ecological economist is a non-determinist. They believe that we face real alternatives and that our future is determined by the choices we make today. Our decisions define our outcomes and the world that we will choose to live in tomorrow. We make our own futures, we make our own choices. There is no such thing as luck. We make our own luck by making the right choices. This is the non-determinist perspective. Let's be clear about this definition by defining determinism as opposed to non-determinism. Determinism in philosophy is a theory that implies that all moral choices or events are completely identified by previous existing causes. And this rules out free will. Again, determinism rules out free will and implies that humans can't alter the outcome of the future because humans can't alter the prior states that have already been determined by the causal outcome. Ecological economists don't believe this. They believe in non-determinism and that we can ultimately determine the outcome by making good choices among our alternatives today. But the ecological economist also presupposes non-nihilism. Nihilism is the rejection of all moral values, the ethical consequence of the materialist determinist cosmology. Non-nihilism, the opposite of nihilism, informs us that there is a real criterion of value to guide our choices. This philosophical theory of non-nihilism allows us to assume that there does exist a criterion of value that can guide our choices. The idea of the good, if you will, that we must use to evaluate our choices against. That is, among our choices, there are good ones and bad ones according to this goodness criterion and that we can use this to rank all alternatives according to the good principle. This is a form of non-nihilism. Non-nihilism allows us to distinguish better from worse states of the world. If there is no value criterion that we can use to judge or evaluate choices, then ultimately there must be no sense of responsibility towards any greater good. And this is why the ecological economist is a non-nihilist. They assume that we must be serious about the real issues that confront us today. We're not simply composed of DNA, genes, and hormones that simply drive us to procreate with little concern toward the greater good. 
we can identify a goodness that we can all work toward. This completes part one of chapter three. In part three, we will discuss the middle where the ends mean spectrum lies. We will also show that there are three possible strategies for integrating ecology and economics. And we will show which strategy equates with the traditional economic models and which model we will use in this course.